What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Local Podcast. I hope you guys had an amazing Labor Day weekend. This is episode 40. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Jordan Hauser Digital. That is my video company here in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. If you and your company are in need of some video marketing content, you can check out greensburgvideo.com. Or if you'd like to sponsor an episode of this very podcast, you can do so by reaching out to me at thelocal724.com and just head over to the contact page and fill out that form. Today, my guest is Stephen Comer. He's the owner of Ascension Digital Media, and he's here to tell us how you can take your business to the next level. So help me welcome a great buddy of mine and a very talented young entrepreneur. Here we go. Welcome to the Local 724 Podcast in three, two, one. Stephen Comer in the house. Jordan, thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. Long time in the making. Hell yeah. It's good to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Thank God for cancellations. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice. I uh, got to like fit you in. I was sitting there and like we were talking the other day at the night market and I was like, man, I want to get him in, but I didn't even have my calendar with me. So right. I was like, and I don't even know, I think I'm booked out to like mid October at this point or late October. So I was like, I don't want to wait that long, no. but here we are. Here we are. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what you do? And uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk some fun shop and all kinds of different stuff. Well, obviously you know, but for those of you listening, the vast majority of what I do is building value for businesses where they haven't been able to already or where they haven't optimized their opportunity. So the vast majority of the nitty gritty of what I do is I do paid advertising for businesses, whether they're local whether they're regional, whether they're international. I have businesses that work with me around the world. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of my uh, bigger clients are overseas, primarily uh, Portugal, Spain. Uh, I do have a lot of local clients, and then I have some other bigger ones across the country. But uh, the vast majority of what I do boils down to how can I continue to improve the quality of life through what I do for others while leaving a meaningful impact wherever I'm at in the world. That's really what it boils down to. That's awesome, man. How did you end up getting clients overseas like how did that how did that happen so how old are you i'm 22 <laughs> yeah let's start there so how did you end up a 22 year old guy getting clients all over the world at this point the biggest thing that i can think of to really sum up everything that has allowed me to get here is just always being able to build value for others just through good clear communication I think I was really blessed at a young age that I was able to realize like, hey, I can talk to anyone regardless of their background, their age, whether or not they're a man or woman or other, uh, whether, you know, they have a preconceived notion about me, whether they don't, whatever their political religi uh, religious affiliation is, I can boil down our conversations to how can I clearly convey what I think and believe to someone else so that we can have a meaningful discussion. And if we have to agree to disagree, I'm not someone who's like so attached to everything that I kind of believe and think today. So that if someone would bring up a better or uh, stronger argument, I can change my opinion. I'm not mm -hmm. so tied that to the, or, how do I put this? My beliefs are not so tied to my identity that I can't forget them for something better. Right. It's not that ingrained in me. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's a good quality for people to have. I, th I really do too. But the thing is, I mean, especially today, you have people everywhere that are just different circumstantially. How do you get around that? Mm -hmm. You have to digest new information, meet new people, be willing to accept that what your reality is is not the reality of others. And the best way to do that is just to learn, interact, go and see what people think and believe. You don't have to do it in person. You can mm -hmm. do it online. But you also have to understand that you have to take a grain of salt with a lot of things these days. Very seldomly is anything online directly relative to what those people or that situation or that organization's reality really is. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all about just like, you know, information, you know, ingesting all of that, adapting and just, you know, moving forward. It's, it's you know, me personally, I'm lucky to have, you know, most of my clients are pretty much on my, my same wavelength as far as like, you know, um, creative goes or... Um, well now I'm starting to figure out like politics and religion and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like, um, just through Facebook and seeing things, but, uh, not that any of that really matters, but it's just like, you know, I'm lucky enough, but you know, 
obviously as the business grows, I'm going to run into people who we don't share the same ideology right. and things like that. So, you know, it's real easy, I think. And what it all boils down to is just kind of like being a humanitarian at that point. It's right. just like, man, be a good person. I like people that are good people. And that's really kind of all it is. I don't give a shit who you like or who you don't like or anything like that. If you're a good person to me or a good person to people that I like and love, then you're a good person to me. Well, that really resonates with me for a lot of reasons, but primarily it goes into like the way I live my life. I've always been a value first type of person. So Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to contribute more than people were initially giving me right off the bat, whether it was their time, their money, their effort, their investment. All of those things really only boil down to me having their trust but that only comes by me first providing value. Yeah. The only way that people are going to be like, Hey, you're 22. Here's a $5,000 a month retainer and you know, a hundred thousand dollars in ad spend go to town is if I can prove one that I actually know what I'm doing two that they can agree with me, communicate with me and also see the value in what I do and trusting that they're reaching out to me or I'm reaching out to them because I'm the professional and they wouldn't have signed a contract or whatever with me if they didn't have a lesser understanding of these things than I do. Yeah. And then also understanding that, you know, just because my age is my age doesn't mean I have the perspective talk or resonate only with my age group. Right. You know, I'm much more than that. And I think it's pretty clear to the people that really know me. Absolutely. That it's, it's so dynamic. I'm not one to beat around the bush. I really try not to inject a lot of bullshit into things because then it just muddles the quality of the relationship that I have with people or Mm -hmm. acquaintances or people that I want to get to know. And the only way to really get around that is to let people see, are you authentic? And if you are coming across as authentic, how much of it really truly is. Right. And that only can be built on with more time spent or more money spent or, you know, just trying to see in the long run, is your first impression right? Yeah, man. I mean, it, it age at this point, I think, doesn't really even factor into my mind. Like, that was a big thing when I was young. Because like when I was your age, I was like, man, I'm not going to get trusted enough to have this type of job until I'm in my 30s. Someone's going to be like, oh, dude, you're like 20. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Like, give me one of those. And, and that did happen. And uh, that happened forever. But now I think it's with like technology and everything being you know where it's at today and everyone being on such a different level. Age has no relevance whatsoever. No you know, as far as intelligence goes, and it never really did. But in the public eye, I think that everyone just assumed like, oh, these, these, they're still kids. Well, you here's know? the other thing too. We, ha- it's so weird that the internet has been around since like the late nineties, but mm-hmm. people are just now realizing that, oh, wow, you don't really need to go through high school and have a professional degree in college and then go into a job where you're getting 20, 30, 40 years of experience and essentially wasting your entire adult life. Right. Trying to be or continue to be the same thing that you were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. That's not how it is anymore. With the advent of the internet and the immediacy and relevancy of new information, it doesn't matter if you're a 20 year old reading Wall Street Journal or if you're 65, you're reading the same stuff, you're being impacted by it the same way. If you read it more and more, the more to light things come to you. Right. But people still forget to recognize that just because you're older doesn't mean you know more. Likewise, it doesn't mean that you're younger. You can, you can do things as easily because you're younger. Right. You know, you always see how like washed out athletes are like, ah, my back, I can't throw a jump shot anymore. It's like, (laughs) uh, you know, you don't have that longevity or that youth the way that you used to, but you still can do it. You just can't do it as much. Right. So that's why I feel like the whole age argument is so full of crap that whenever you go to look at like, Oh, you've been on wall street for 65 years. You must trade, you know, better than anybody else. Well, you can have someone who's 25 or 30 now that's digesting the same information that that guy is and doing Mm -hmm. better. And because he's younger, he's not going to be taken as seriously. Right. Just because experience means something doesn't mean it means everything. Yeah, dude. I like the way that, uh, I like that. It definitely doesn't. I mean, like, I think one of my biggest problems was coming out of college and, you know, you, you go and you fill out these resumes and these, uh, applications for, um, you know, ads, entry, entry level jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's like entry level, but they want like two to three years of experience or something. And you're like, how the fuck am I supposed to get this job if I don't have the experience and how am I supposed to get the experience if I don't have this job? Right. It's like a vicious cycle. It's and oxymoronic because like, yeah. what happens is, is that you have 
Uh, employers wanting more qualified employees right off the bat. You mm-hmm. want them to have lower entry level jobs, but those jobs can't sustain their living, even if it's as basic as it gets. Mm-hmm. And then from there, you it's always a piss match between all the people like, oh, you have six degrees, only t- one of which is relevant to what we do, but that's better on paper than everybody else that's hiring or that we've prospected. So come aboard. Right. The relevant experience is more important than any degree will ever be because it goes to, I mean, look at what's going on now in the world. The coronavirus mm-hmm. pandemic has essentially turned every university to Zoom University. Yep. You're paying money for a degree where, I mean, in my personal experience, the school will remain unnamed, but you're learning on VHS tapes in 2019, 2020. Right. Really? Yep. And we're paying a full price to it. Are you, that doesn't make sense to me. Why are we paying an absorbent amount of money for a job today, learning information that's 20, 30 years old? Yeah. How that the system's broken. I think that the coronavirus has definitely brought that a little bit more out into the light. Mm -hmm. But I will also say that there's value in learning information anywhere. The thing is, is does the piece of paper still mean something at the end of the day? Dude, it was wild. I mean, like my first couple video jobs, my, my boss, my direct boss had a lesser degree than I did and it sucked every single day because like I would have, you know, these guys saying like, Oh, Hey, can you help me do this? And like, I'm literally, and I don't mind, like I'll help anybody. I'll teach anybody. Didn't matter that they were my boss. It was the paycheck that mattered to me. I was just like, man, I'm making $10,000 less than this guy. I have a, I have a bachelor's degree. He has an associate's degree. He was here for like two years more than me Mm -hmm. and he's making $10,000 more than me. Get out of here. It's not fair, is like, it? Like, I'm teaching this guy how to do shit. <laughs> like, you know? It's absurd. I mean, I mean, I know people that have been in the marketing industry for, you know, decades that yeah. have come to me for advice because I have the recognition now. I mean, I don't know any, and I won't bring my income into this, but I will say that whenever I have people two and three times my age coming to me for advice where I've only been doing this for five years, it just goes to show you that anything's possible as long as you put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that it doesn't work in the traditional corporate hierarchy structure. Right. You know, the reason that I'm able to get the recognition that I have is because I work for myself. If I was, you know, a mid-level advertising specialist or marketing Mm -hmm. professional, no one would come to me because no one gives a shit. Exactly. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm working for Deloitte or Hershey or Heinz, whatever. I'm working for a big company. Absolutely. I'm not working for myself. I'm not working for my own brand. But the brand is what gets recognition at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So what's the point in doing it for someone else where you know you can do it well whenever you could do it for yourself as a contractual or a contract-based employee And go do it for other people. That's where you really start to open up everything. And like you were getting at before, like, how do I have clients from across the world? Building meaningful relationships. Yeah. Networking's really important to me. Getting to know people on a meaningful level. There have been days where, not even necessarily days, but like, there is one really good friend of mine that I've never met in person, but he does some phenomenal work for me Mm -hmm. where I would do essentially a month's worth of consulting totally free just to understand his character because I saw potential. Now he's overseas in the UK getting me three, four, five, six new clients a month. That's awesome. It's phenomenal, but yeah. you can't do that without having the conversation and putting yourself out there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, that corporate structure, the thing like, you know, and, and you're hundred percent right. Nobody from, from up top is going to come down the ladder to talk no. to you. And it's, it literally, those titles, those titles mean so much mm-hmm. like to the point where this is, this is hilarious. I got shifted around in uh, the company that I used to work for. And what essentially I was doing was video directing and, uh, you know, shooting videos and and directing videos. Well, I asked for my title to be updated because I wanted my pay to be updated and Mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And when it came down to title, it was not, they were not budging. And I was like, why? I'm like, what is the big deal? And finally, the HR person said, look, it has the word director in the title, and that is a level here, so we can't really call you a director. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, that's my job. That's what I'm doing. I am a video director, and you won't call me that because my director of my department is throwing a, a like a hissy fit. Yeah. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. It was so ridiculous. And I was just like, man... That really was the end of like the corporate era for me. I was just like, I, I don't understand this. Mm-hmm. And I just so badly want to like jump ship, do my own thing 
and have it not be about titles and, and, and bullshit like that, but have it be about what I can provide to you, the value that I can provide. And if you like it, awesome. Let's continue. If you don't like it, cool, go find somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, and that's that it's why portfolios are so important. Not to be fair. I never really keep up with mine unless it's for like case studies where mm -hmm. we're sending out emails to prospects, but it's, it really just goes to show the quality of your work means more than the title associated with it because you could yeah. be an entry level employee doing amazing work, significantly better than, you know, two, three rungs up the ladder. Oh, yeah. But if no one sees it or takes it seriously, what are they going to do with it. It's essentially a slap in the face to yourself. But at the same time, it just goes to show that if the right eyes see it, it can make a world of a difference. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is you have to be able to get out there in order to do that. Yeah. If you try and stick to your own company, you know, just because you have history with them doesn't mean that they're going to treat you better. Right. Yeah, definitely not. That's, that's not a thing. No. It, I mean, as much as it might have used to be. In used to be. Like the 70s, 80s, right. maybe into the 90s. Definitely it ended at the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. I would say that you have so much more potential nowadays doing your own thing to where you were essentially responsible for your success or your failure. You're responsible to collect your paychecks. Mm -hmm. You at that point are free. Yeah. You don't have to worry about, Oh, when am I getting that next promotion? I can't take vacation days. I can't take sick days. I need to work from home today because my kid got kicked out of school. Yeah. If you have someone to answer to, you can't do that. Answer to yourself, you idiot. Right. Like yeah. create that flexibility. I mean, I'm 22 and I have a massive business, especially for my age. I'm not on the 30 under 30 or anything like that, but everybody can do what I do. Anybody can do what they want to do. The question yeah. is, is how do you turn what you're passionate about into something that's going to create freedom in other areas of your life? Mm -hmm. Even though that might be a stress reliever or something that frees you from stress, What's going to free you from worrying about paying your bills? What's yeah. going to free you from worrying about your family and their health and whether or not you can provide for them? And why are you going to weather or worry about having a roof over your head? Be responsible for everything. The thing about corporate jobs, why people love them is because of complacency. Oh, yeah. You're getting paid 40 hours a week to essentially do eight hours worth of work a week. That's the average for the actual high focus work that you're doing. Yeah. So you're doing one day's work to get paid for 40 hours a week and you're worrying about whether or not the longevity of your crappy work ethic is going to continue to keep bankrolling your family. Right. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. But you're, if you're responsible you're for right. it on your own, then you can be like, okay, I can put my 40 hours of decent work a weekend for myself and make mm -hmm. four or five times, uh, you know, as much as you, as much money as you want, realistically speaking, depending on your manpower and whether you want to scale yeah. or whatever. Why wouldn't you do that? The thing is people worry too much because of complacency for not wanting to do more. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Let's talk entrepreneurship here in one second. I want to take a detour for all the, uh, completely, you know, idiot people out there. What is it that you do? Okay. So as dumbed down as it gets, yes, I work with businesses to run paid advertising for them. So essentially like, uh, I have a retainer depending on the level of interest that you have in my service. Uh, then from there you set aside a paid ads budget. I use that budget and get the ads rolling and I put them in front of the right people so that they convert on average. We're looking anywhere from 10 to 20 times your money back on each dollar spent on ads. Mm -hmm. And that's on social media, primarily social media. The biggest platforms that I use are Facebook and Instagram because the ad platform is all Facebook. So it just integrates into both because they own both. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a little bit of LinkedIn here or there. I do some YouTube. I do Google ads. I mean, effectively anything that gets your brand more presence online, chances are we do it. Yeah. If not, we know someone that does it. The big thing that I'm really focusing on right now is trying to find a way for Facebook to not treat people that are dumping six and seven figures of ad revenue into their pocket so poorly. Cause like I mentioned before this week, yeah. I had six ad accounts get disabled for not a single policy violation because it's the platform where we get the best results. It's a little bit of a disparity to us because mm -hmm. of the fact that like, Hey, we aren't doing anything wrong yet. yet you're punishing us. Right. But nonetheless, that's where we get some really impressive results. So that's the big thing. Other than that, I'm trying to get a lot more into consulting content creation. We do some photography, videography for local clients, but mm -hmm. it's not my passion. I don't want to tie yeah. up my time doing that. I'd rather have someone like you or someone uh, within my agency do it if they're comfortable doing it. But even beyond that, it's just like, what can we do next? I'm always right. trying to push the envelope a little bit more, but at the same time, 
you know, there's only so many hours in the day and we all have the same amount of time. Yeah. So at what point do I completely stress myself out again, trying to get everything done that I'm choosing to do whenever I could pump the brakes a little bit, not be so worried because of the fact that all the important things are getting done, but like the side projects and whatnot, they need yeah. to be a little bit more thought out, uh, at least in my opinion. So with that being said, you know, my big focus is every day, client relations, sales, running ads. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And like, I mean, even though you're taking care of these businesses that are, you know, abroad and, and in other countries and all that stuff, you still work with a bunch of local clients as well, right? Absolutely. And here's the big deal is that I've always wanted to focus local. I know that you know the story about some of my ex-partners at this point, mm -hmm. but uh, I won't get into that on here for my peace of mind and theirs. But <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, the big thing for me is... <sighs> I'm getting so caught up in this that I actually forgot your question. What did you ask? <laughs> so just like, you know, oh, you're locally local focused. Yes. So the focus I wanted to have at the time that I had my ex-partners on board was focusing local because I look at growth like mold. Over time, it starts to progress, but you don't see it at the surface level yet. And then one day you do. And then from there, it just gets wild. The way that I thought about this is if we can grow and invest a lot of time into growing local businesses, especially during coronavirus, because this is evidently showing that this is a fight or flight moment for a lot of business owners. Yeah. If we can have a very concentrated area, it will become twice as large where we're getting passive referrals. So we don't have to worry about getting leads locally, building a bigger name for us. And until we get to like the Pittsburgh area where it gets hyper competitive, but not that this industry isn't already hyper competitive, but like that's in droves more competitive. Yeah. I would say that it would be great for us because then we always have a consistent local customer base where we can always be at their office. That's something that whenever I started, I prided myself on and I still do for my local businesses. If you need to meet me the next day and I can fit in my schedule, I'll be there. Right. I want to be able to shake your hand, sign your paperwork, do anything I can in the comfort of your own office or your place of business or with your clients. If we don't do that. We don't build personability. So then why does what we do on an individual basis, day in, day out, that gives us satisfaction, we're not getting recognized for locally. I mean, mm -hmm. think about this, the local 724 pod. Yeah. You know, you're doing it because it's local. You want to highlight local businesses. And ultimately, that's going to get your other business name thrown out a little bit more. Yeah. It's all about creating beneficial angles for everyone. And that's where the value first approach that I'm a firm believer in kind of shows through you yeah you know it's all about how can you continually show people like hey i can do a good job i'm a firm believer in what we can do together give me a shot yeah if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out that doesn't mean that it has to hurt our personal relationship but at the same time you know we understand that your particular situation might not work out and a lot of times that's not the case a lot of times it's phenomenal it just mm -hmm. depends on the industry you're in obviously some are a little easier to market than others you know like car dealerships are pretty easy sure uh any sort of family practice dentistry or any sort of medical clinic that isn't attached to like Excel, AHN or UPMC. Uh, trying to think restaurants are a big one. I mean, there's a lot of little stuff here and there. The thing is though, is like for say a massive IT company. Well, a lot of consumers don't know what IT really means. And at right, the same yeah. time, not individuals are not going to IT companies. Right, say, hey, yeah. I need an independent server in my basement. Uh, yeah. It doesn't happen like that. So you have a much more, B2B focus, mm -hmm. where that is inherently a little bit more difficult, which is why LinkedIn prides themselves on having really expensive advertising because they know that you're there to solicit other businesses for money. Yep. So with Facebook, it's all pretty much stuff locally that we like to try to be more on the consumer or B2C face yeah. uh, just because it's significantly easier to get brand recognition, but not only that, get better, more meaningful sales. Yeah. But beyond that, I've always wanted to focus local because I like not that I need the recognition, but I like that people know what I do so that I'm the go-to for it. Absolutely. It's something that I tell a lot of the car dealerships that I work with around here is like, hey, if you're a salesperson, you need to get on Instagram and Facebook more and leverage your personal brand. People know who Bud Smale is. People know who Star Chevrolet is. People know who Hillview Motors is. Mm -hmm. What they don't know is who's going to directly facilitate what they need. So if you're putting out the specials, if you're saying, hey, come see me, they're going to go looking for you. You're leveraging your personal brand if they see it. And even if they don't, then, you know, they stop by the lot window shopping one time and you say, hey, connect with me on Instagram or Facebook. You're still constantly keeping that fresh and in their mind because you're putting out content, interacting with them or engaging with their stuff. And then from there, you have a more meaningful relationship by the time you go to sale and it's based in trust. Yeah. Because they can see more of what you do, they will inherently be willing to subconsciously trust you more because you're 
on your A game always, mm-hmm. which is kind of the misleading nature of social media. So they call it the highlight reel, right? So, right, yeah. You know, you never really get to see a lot of the more negative parts of people's lives because they choose not to share it. But at the same time, like that's where the inauth- inauthenticity of social media comes through. I try not to be like that. I know that you follow me and I know yeah. a lot of people locally follow me. Like the, I do a little bit of day trading on the side. There's, I show my wins and losses. Yeah, and you it's, do. It's just the way it goes because I don't want people to think that like I'm only constantly improving on myself, which right. I am. But there's things out of my control that, you know, it is what it is. Right. Everybody has a shitty day. Right. I mean, like being authentic, I think, is one of the most important things that you can do in business. Right. And, you know, that was something that I try to pride myself on the most. Like when I talk to people, I talk like myself. I don't go in there and put on some kind of like pony show or anything. If I show up, I mean, I'm literally, I show up the way I dress. I show up in a backwards hat. I want them to know who they're working with. Right. You know what I mean? And that's a big thing. Like to them, they know who they're working with. They know what they're getting. I'm an old school skateboarder. Yeah. And you know, I took my, I took my uh, artistic abilities and and turned them into, you know, digital creative. And it's just like, that's what I want people to see like on this podcast. I want people to see like behind, you know, the Instagram versus reality. Mm -hmm. I want, I want people to see the reality of people, like what they deal with on a day to day basis. Like, Oh my God, my kid came in and uh, I was in the shower and they, they drew all over the wall in Sharpie marker. Mm -hmm. Like we've heard funny stories on this podcast that make people really look at these business owners as people. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing is like people get really s- a separated sense of reality from work and reality from their personal life. Mm-hmm. I myself, because I work 16 to 18 hours a day, I have that continuity. <laughs> you're a nutcase, yeah. dude. <laughs> Every time I call you, you're working. I'm right. And that's <laughs> the thing is that I'm so in love with what I do that I don't see it as work. But at the same time, because I know that what I do every day directly impacts people's lives more often than not in a positive way that mm-hmm. I am more than happy to spend the time doing it right. Yeah. That's the, I mean, I could waste time doing everything poorly or half-assing things, but no one benefits from that. Cause I'm also a firm believer that short-term money isn't good because what comes quickly will go quickly. Absolutely. And long-term money doesn't come without building meaningful relationships. So if mm-hmm. I'm not going to spend the time, then I can expect that money. I just got to not come again. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like that's, it's exactly exactly the thought that like, you know, I don't think that people really understand that all the time. No. Like you'll see people go out and maybe sign a, uh, a short deal or something like that. And it's time to go buy a car. And it's like, man, you might want to hold on to that yeah. for a little bit. Make sure that the value you're providing that client is something that is going to end in a long game. Right. Because like, dude, if that's the case, then yeah, Go buy your car, go do that. Just wait a few months, check it out. If they're in love with your product, if you're if they're in love with what you're giving them, the sky's the limit at that point. That's right. And you can take that relationship and just start splitting. Like, mm-hmm. you know, growing like mold. Yep. <laughs> Basically. And exactly what you said. It, it's a weird way to put it, but that's the closest way I can honestly think of yeah. portraying that analogy. You know, you mm-hmm. have a little bit and then that hyper concentrated little bit you see the next day is just massive. Yeah. But it doesn't come without all the prep work. It has to go in. And this is a bad analogy for this reason, because essentially you're saying something has to go bad before it grows, but see the bad as positive. You want to get to the point where it spreads. You want to look at the positive side of things. And that's honestly Mm -hmm. another reason why I think I've been able to kind of get as far as I have in as short of a time as I have, because I've only been doing what I do for like five and a half, six years. Yeah. But I always look for the little bit of light in the, really dark areas of people's lives or society at large or my own personal life Mm -hmm. because it not only does it give you a point to focus on, but it also shows that, Hey, this isn't all that bad. Yeah. At some point the light will flood in. I am a firm believer in the fact that you get out of life, what you make out of it and you can't make anything out of nothing. So you have to put in the blood, sweat, tears. You have to put in the money. You have to invest in yourself. You have to be willing to learn constantly if you're not willing to do those things then expect it to be a dark and cloudy day every day. Yeah. I mean, dude, it's, you know, the investment in yourself is, you know, again, another important thing. I mean, you just have to, it's absolutely, yeah. you have to, you know, especially like in my video business, I have to keep up, you know, with, with trends, you know, mm-hmm. uh, cameras and, you know, resolutions, 4k, 
all that stuff. Yep. Like you have to like, you have to get there, but you don't have to like, like, right. I was talking with a buddy of mine. He was on the podcast uh, before Fernando mm. and uh, we were chatting at the uh, palace theater concerts that we did last week. And um, we were sitting there talking about this new camera, the Canon, like R five or six or something like that. It shoots eight K. And I literally, he was like, so what do you think? And I'm like, dude, it's fucking pointless. It's all bullshit. It's bullshit. It is bullshit. And not only that, it doesn't matter if you shoot an 8K. There, I don't think there's a single screen that actually shows 8K. Right. So beyond that, you have two inherent issues. One obvious marketing hype to have yep. the newest best thing. And then you also have the lack of practicality because what you're paying for is useless because there's nothing to display that. Exactly. I mean, that's why like whenever... Uh, like cable networks and whatnot and mm-hmm. Netflix and Hulu all said, oh, we're going to start streaming in 4K. We're going to charge you more for it. It looks the exact same as 1080p for the most part, unless yeah. you have a absolutely stunning TV and you have the best HDMI cables and you have the best network connection. Yeah. Because here's the thing. It doesn't matter if they're streaming in 4K if you get 20 megabytes download. Right. So what's the point? Yep. It doesn't make a difference because ultimately at the end of the day, you're getting sold on marketing hype that isn't It's not a value builder because there's so many things that are detracting from the actual thing that you're being sold on. Yeah. I mean, if you're just going to take that and down res it to 1080 anyway, I mean like, yeah, it's going to look a little better, but like, dude, for, for the, for the trouble that you have to go through, like, could you even imagine, I mean, you edit, you edit some videos, Yeah, you edit in 1080. Have you ever edited a 4k video? I have. How much does that suck? When it comes to your computer being like, hey, man, what are you doing to me? I keep a fire extinguisher (laughs) by my MacBook Pro in the event that it suddenly combusts because it's absolutely absurd. I mean, I have fans constantly underneath my laptop whenever I'm actually doing video editing because even, you know, UHD, Mm -hmm. it I can feel the ice caps melting underneath my keyboard because it's so damn hot. But at the end of the day, I'm like, look, Instagram, um, if you have shitty service or your Wi-Fi is garbage you're not going to see it in 4K or 1080p anyway. Yeah, you're not. I just want it to look clear enough to where people are like, huh, that was a funny meme, or huh, that was pretty informational, or whatever. You know, it's not so much about the hype. As long as you have the understanding that the quality is dependent on so many different things, then you also understand that there's some things out of your control that you just really shouldn't worry about. Right. You did what you could. I mean, if you can send the actual video to people, but if you're also downloading or, you know, editing a video in 4k you also have a gigabyte and a half for like a you know three to five minute video that you're trying to send someone which you'll never be able to so what's yeah, the point exactly yeah it's, it's it's ridiculous i mean the big thing like now i think uh especially being you know kind of real big into youtube and all of that stuff is mm-hmm. just like what i've learned has really been it's content it's story, you know, how can, how do you make that audience feel? How do you impact them, you know, emotionally, uh, all kinds of different ways, just like, you know, it's, it's old school advertising at its finest. And that is like what really pumps me up. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I want to bring to this local market. Not just like, yeah. And not just like, you know, drive down route 30 and check out the blah, blah, blah. And, the blah, and like you get the fucking establishing shot. You get the shot of this and that dude. I want a story, man. Everybody wants a story. And that's why podcasts are so big because right? it gets rid of the infomercial Regis and Kelly bullshit. Yeah. That like, Oh, everything is super scripted. And if you don't sound exciting, then people aren't going to like it. Well, people also don't like constant happiness, which is why I think the world is in the weird kind of (laughs) rock and hard play situation that it feels like. Right. Because whenever people, especially super impressionable young kids, not necessarily even my age, but inclusive of my age, probably anybody who's like 12 to 25 right now, constantly being sold on the fact that you need to be happy 24 hours of every day of your existence is absolutely stupid. Oh, yeah. You are setting yourself up for a lifelong prescription of, you know, antidepressants and things like that because you have such poorly framed expectations. Yeah. Because mom and dad sold you that it's rainbows, sunshines, cats and dogs all day, every day. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Especially for a lot of people that have, you know, pretty bad living situations, whether it's, you know, you're living in poverty or you have a bad home life. People that have something that 
makes them fearful daily. Mm -hmm. They understand that life isn't sunshine and rainbows every day. The thing is, is how do you get out of that? You either have to remove yourself from the situation, which requires a lot of risk, requires that stage of your life, probably a lot of money or a really loving family member that is going to give you a better situation than your current family can. Mm -hmm. So alternatively, I mean, it's like the people that live paycheck to paycheck. Well, obviously your situation or circumstances are dictated by what you do to earn money. Mm -hmm. If you're not constantly trying to improve yourself as a person, what makes you think that they're going to improve the wage that you're paid? Right. You know, there's, there's so much to life that's predicated on waiting for someone else to dictate your next step. But if you take the time, effort, energy to improve yourself daily, even just a half a percent. Yeah. If you're a half a percent better every day, that makes a big difference considering that you're 15% better as a person by the end of the month. Yeah. Not that you can really quantify that, but at the end of the day, if you're making improvements where, you know, you were lacking before, or you didn't put any effort or energy into before you're going to be better off for it and not that long. I agree. I mean, like, you know, and it's not like we're not like shitting on like nine to fives here or anything like that. It's the thing that uh, like I'm getting from this is like, you know, you, it's really important that if you want to do something that you, you do it. Control what you can control. Right. Nobody's going to come and give it to you. It's not going to happen. Like, you know, getting back into the entrepreneurial you know, aspect of what we do. It's like, that is the, one of the scariest things to do once you are inundated in the, in mm-hmm. the corporate, uh, corporate atmosphere and that life and all of that, you know, because you do get complacent, you get so comfortable and it's mm-hmm. like every morning, you know, you're on your way to work. You listen to a podcast, you get to work, you say hi to the same people every single day, ask about the same shit every day. You're yep. not listening. Nope. Go get your coffee. You go up to the, outstanding cafeteria mm-hmm. and you get yourself a, a a fucking omelet with cheese and broccoli and all that stuff from a professional chef while you're at work, you know, you pay like minimal money to get that. And then you have a beautiful lunch and you know, you're in the middle of the city, all this stuff, mm-hmm. all of that is great. And it really gives you an inflated sense of importance. And you really just sit there and think that you are really fucking awesome at life. Then, you come home and your wife says, how was your day? And you're literally like, I don't want to fucking talk. No. And you rail a fucking bottle of whiskey down your throat. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this is how I deal with my happiness, yeah. my corporate happiness. And it's just like, if you don't want some people fucking thrive in that environment, people love it. Some people are so good at it. People like the competition within a yeah. workspace, which I can totally understand. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like you mentioned before, a lot of their routine is just living their life as they would at home in an office building. Yeah. And that's such full of shit because of the fact that you're looking at, you know, oh, I get my nice made for me breakfast. I get my nice made for me lunch. I'm in meetings all day. Well, what are you doing that's actually productive? What's justifying your salary? Because that's the thing. They'll continue to pay you as much as they can until it comes time to cut costs. And then you're the first out the door. Yeah. Employees are the biggest expense of any business, which is another reason why for the most part, I'm commission only for a lot of my people that work with me or Mm -hmm. any uh, other agencies that partner with me because of the fact that I know that if you're doing action items that directly result in new sales or in a new client, you're actually getting something out of it the same way that I'm getting something out of it. Cause yeah. I don't make more money unless I get more clients or unless we do phenomenally with ads and we get a percentage of the return, mm-hmm. you know, with there's always a way to make a deal, but at the same time you're making the lack of making deals with yourself is so, so bad for you. You know, yeah. so many people are aspirational to have the best things in life, but how seldomly will someone come and hand you the keys to a new Lamborghini and say, hey, all I need you to do is sign the registration paperwork and you're good to go. You better start looking for the camera because they're about to get you. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, like, why <laughs> why would you waste your time? So there is so much complacency in, you know, corporate structure or in regular, you know, giving or getting a wage or a salary. It's like if you want more out of life, you need to be a quadriplegic thrown in the deep end because it's a real struggle to yeah. <laughs> get your head above the water whenever you have to rely on yourself. But then once you get that first gasp of fresh air, you really feel satisfied because you know that this was all on you. You weren't banking on a team of people right. picking up your slack, trying to get you ahead. Mm-hmm. That shows through after about, mm, I would say three or four big projects. Yeah. 
because in the corporate structure, you know, oh, who's contributing this? Who's contributing that? Who's speaking on the things the most? You can see that the level of understanding is directly relative to the hands-on time that you're putting into stuff. Yeah. If you're not putting the time in, you will not get anything out. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, like when I started my business full, t- when I, not when I started it, when I went full time into my business, dude, it was literally like I had friends, family, everyone just like, are you able to do this? Like, mm-hmm. are you good? And I was like, I get I that every day. Don't fucking know, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. Mm-hmm. And what happened was people immediately started taking me more serious. Right. And I started getting more jobs and this sounds so stupid, but when I realized that I was making my car payment and paying my bills every month and everything was still okay, I was still alive. I was still doing it. You're like, shit, then I was like, it's working. Yeah. It's fucking working. And then, you know, a couple years later, you get to invest in in a side project that you want to do, like Uh something like this. And it's just like, all right, things are building. You've built relationships. It's just like, it's such a fantastic thing to be able to take and trust yourself mm-hmm. so much that you're like, you can do this and you have to, you have to work hard every day. Right. That doesn't mean that you can't go get a haircut at 10 a.m. or go take a run at one o'clock. And you the make afternoon. it work. You've always find a way to make it. That's exactly. why we're here today. Yep. Cause I was able to find a way to make it work. Yeah, dude. It's, it's fantastic to be your own boss is something just like incredibly fantastic. And you know, all the entrepreneurs out there, I think that are listening to this episode, like this one is going to be something that people are very, very excited about. I think I this one's so. going to be a good hook. Um, what are some of the, uh, you got any like little tips and tricks or something that people can immediately do to kind of just like, you know, improve on their, their right. situation online, get their, uh, I actually do. Nice. And it boils down to a couple things that you could actually probably it was not the last post I put on Instagram, but the one before that I put in some of those things and it, I don't know if I can I do a little plug. Absolutely. Do it, plug it, away. If you want to uh, follow me on Instagram, it's at S T E P H E N K O M M E R. Uh, a lot of my stuff is, you know, bullshit pictures of me, but always pay attention to the captions because that's where people really get the value and takeaways mm-hmm. out of this. But Honestly, the most important thing that I can think about is pay attention to what strangers always compliment you on. Because that's saying that someone who doesn't even know you can see something clear as day that you do well. Why would you not pay attention to that? Right. It would be so stupid. It would be so infinitesimally stupid to not pay attention to the things that you're naturally good at that even strangers can recognize. Beyond that, you always have to be committed to yourself. I mean, you can feel it in your days where you feel productive and where you're underproductive because you know that you're letting yourself down and that guilt gets to you whenever you're starting to make Mm -hmm. forward progress. Other than that, uh, you know, right now is a great time to just try shit because we all have the same 24 hours in the day. Yeah, we're spending them differently, but a lot of us are just stuck at home with nothing to do, whether it's online classes, whether it's working remotely. You're getting the majority of your work done in less time than it would typically take you because you're not in a physical office or classroom setting. Mm -hmm. You know, start a side hustle. cost twenty dollars to go to you know a thrift shop find vintage clothes and try and flip them online yeah you know you can start a business with less than a hundred dollars you really can so why would you if i mean given i get that times are a little tough right now not everybody has a hundred dollars to just risk Mm -hmm. but the second that you get rid of that poverty mindset saying that oh i need to save more just because that's how i'm going to make more that's not how it works right you have to find constantly new ways to make more money because then the saving doesn't become a problem you constantly have to spend money to make money that phrase and saying has stood the test of time for a good reason yeah you can't get more with the same amount forever you will get something for that initial investment, but that initial investment only works for so long. You constantly have to be reinvesting in yourself. Buy a damn book and read it. Yeah. Listen to podcasts. Find a way to get more insight on something. Talk to people. People really, really are lonely right now. Mm -hmm. Imagine the amount of people going to come out of this pandemic and lockdown with new addictions. For sure. disgusting to think about for many reasons. But the single most important thing is there was no one that they were talking to preventing them from making those decisions. Right. Talk to people. I know it's a lost thing these days where like even before the pandemic, you don't want to talk to strangers. Everybody's a dick to one another. Yeah. You don't have to be. (laughs) No. People miss human interaction. That's why you see all these 
kids at school that they allowed to go back on campus getting shut down in a week because they're partying and wanting to be with people. Right. It was the first time they've had the opportunity since March. I mean, I graduated in April and I haven't seen anyone from school outside of a couple people because they were leaving Yeah. Uh, to go home because they graduated too. But, you know, it's absolutely disgusting to see how people used to treat each other. And I think that we have a really, really big human decency problem. For sure. Become a more decent human. I mean, we see it right now massively with like the riots and mm-hmm. you know different activist movements going on. Say I want, and I always do this, I always hold the door for the people behind me if I can. Absolutely. People are finding ways to say like, oh, you didn't have to do that for me because I'm a woman. Or, oh, you didn't hold the door for me because I'm a person of color. No, that's you, you're a shitty person if you're not holding the door for anybody regardless right, yeah. of those things. Be a decent human first, then worry about all these stupid problems later. Not that those things aren't things that need addressed, but like if people were just decent to one another, we would not have the issues that we do today. So work on being a decent human. Let that shine through your personality, mm-hmm. and then things will just naturally start to gravitate towards you. It's amazing how the more opportunities you get and capitalize on and they pan out well, more stuff just keeps coming and coming. Yeah. You really need to focus it's on manifesting. It's manifestation and it's most simple form. Yeah. I will say that mindset is a big thing. Start thinking positively, start being optimistic, always be willing to try something once. If you aren't, you're just limiting yourself. The big thing is, is just understand with all these things being said, understand boundaries Mm because as much as opportunity is great, understanding where your line is and not to cross it is also very important. Yep. I post, uh, I posted this on Instagram the other day because it was a situation that I was getting into that I recognized wasn't for me just because me and this person were not on the same ethical terms. Do not work people that compromise their moral compass for the sake of more money because you'll be the first person to get screwed regardless of how well things go. Oh, yeah. Always be willing to trust your gut feeling mm-hmm. because if you don't, I promise you, you, you are going to be so much worse off for it. And the yeah. guilt is much heavier than your pockets will ever be. Absolutely. Dude, it is, it's, it's one of those things. Like when I used to go shoot weddings, that was my big thing. I was just like, we would have our consultation and, you know, they thought they were coming to tell me exactly what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of every meeting, I would say, why you're actually here is to make sure that you and I can have a conversation and that we're a good fit for each other. Right. Because if I don't like you or you don't like me, we're not doing business together. Nope. There's no way that I'm going to take an entire Saturday of my life spend it with you and your family if I don't like you. Mm -hmm. And then I have to spend another week after that editing your stuff, looking at you. Yeah. And if I don't like you, I'm going to be fucking miserable. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And there, you know, and everyone would just like, look at me like, Whoa, that's like super truthful. And I'm like, I'm a very truthful person sometimes to my demise, but Hey, right. And that's the thing. Sugarcoating stuff doesn't get you anywhere because then you're misleading people and miss construed expectations are Mm -hmm. a big reason why things don't work. Yeah. If you have, that's why like any of my new clients or any of my new prospects, I say like, Hey, look, the results that we showed you, that is our client. And those are the results we got for them. But your geographic circumstances may be different. Your immediate demographic circumstances may be different. We can't guarantee the same results. Mm -hmm. You could be the same exact type of business offering the same exact products or services. And if you're in a different geography and we don't know that geography, which is why I focus on local because I know the way things work around here then you understand that it can be different. Maybe not that different, maybe wildly different, but you don't know until you try at least once. Yep. So say there is a small business in town and I'm talking like a small business, just Mm -hmm. like anything, a shop or a flower shop or something like that. And they want to have you help them build their presence online. Mm -hmm. What, what does it take to to, to, to start that? Honestly, it's just a conversation at first. I need to understand what their typical uh, margins are mm-hmm. so I can understand what we're working with ad wise so that we know that, you know, it takes X amount of money before we start losing money to get the sale. I need to understand the health of their business because an unhealthy business, just trying anything is not going to end well. Yeah. Cause if it just goes to show you're frantically spending to see if you can survive, you're not going to, you need to be calculated and methodical in business and being willy nilly about the finances of your business is not going to help you. Right. Beyond that, you have the fact that, you know, every person I work with for the most part gets different stuff. So if you need a website 
SEO and ads, it's going to cost differently than something for just SEO or just ads or a Facebook page uh, management and ads. Mm -hmm. Like I said, everything that I do, as long as it involves getting your brands a little bit more presence or more sales online, chances are we do it. And that's why everything is specific to the businesses that we work with. We have packages internally to like get a framework of, you know, it's probably going to cost us around this much for this, this, and this. If you get a lot of services, we try and give you a discount and help you out because we appreciate the added business. You don't have to go with us for everything, but it does make things easier on everybody communications wise. But, you know, on average, I have probably retainers starting at somewhere in the neighborhood of 1500 for paid ads. Mm -hmm. If it's a local business, I try and work with them on the price because I know that every local business is different. Yeah. But with big businesses that we know like, Hey, they're giving us a $30,000 ad budget. We know that our retainer is going to be full price. Yeah. So it really just depends highly on the expectations, the health of the business, what their margins are, the industry they're in. So that if like, say there's an industry that we want to break into, but we haven't yet because we haven't found the right client to do so with, Mm -hmm. then we'll give you a discount because we want to try this out because we don't know how this is going to work. Right. I mean, we just ran into this with, uh, what is it? Mobile detailing business in the UK. Okay. So we've done detailers before, but we haven't done mobile detailers. I don't know the demographics of Essex, England. So I don't really know how this is going to go because I don't know if that's where money is. I don't, a lot of the success of my business and the success for the clients is boiled down to solid background investigation. If you don't do that, you, and this goes into so many things in life. If you don't do your due diligence, be prepared for anything. If I do the background research before we even get started and say like, hey, this might not work here, but if we shift the targeting a little bit outside of where your operating radius is, it could do well. Thing is, is we're probably still going to have a harder time because it's a little bit outside of where you guys typically operate, but we'll Mm -hmm. give it a go. It's all about testing for about the first 45 days. And then once we find the ads, uh, targets and whatnot that work well, then we scale those. But about half the time we find duds. So we have to spend money to figure out if it's worth spending more. That's just the way it goes. Dude. It's awesome, man. I thank you for coming in here. Thank you for I having think, me. Uh, dude, this, this was awesome. I mean, if you're listening to the show and you're not like motivated to get your ass up off the couch and go fucking do something, do it. then go I don't do know. Push-ups. I don't know what's, I don't know what's wrong with you. I mean, like this is, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm like so amped up right now. Like I was going to go home and just like, you know, do some like work around the house. I, I want to go do something. Go climb I go, right. Yeah. yeah. It's inspirational, man. You're an inspirational guy. Well, the big thing that I've always appreciated is people's honesty with me. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate when I hear stuff like that. Sometimes it gets to my head like anybody else. That's all right. It would. But uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I know we've been trying to do this forever. And I hope that anybody that got something out of this will take the time, like 30 seconds to connect with me wherever they can find me just so I can have a conversation with you guys. I'm not hard to get a hold of. I always get told that I'm intimidating. I'm really hard to approach, stuff like that. That is the <laughs> furthest thing from the truth. That's not true at all. It is the furthest thing from the truth. So please don't at all think that if you try and reach out to me that you're not going to get a message back or before you even try and send it, that, oh, it's not worth it because I'm not going to hear back. You there, you will. It might take some time. I'm a yeah. pretty busy guy. I'm on my phone all day. I might have something in the neighborhood of 745 text messages and 78 missed Jesus. calls. But uh, yeah, I, I will get back to you as soon as I can. Yeah. Dude, yeah, the people could not have pegged you more wrong. I mean, we've known each other for a little over a year at this point, and Mm -hmm. you're one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I appreciate it. That's absurd. So, yeah, if uh, anybody's looking to, uh, you know, scale their business and really, really jump into the deep end, then uh, you want to get a hold of Steve in here. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, brother. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much. All right, there you go. Stephen Comer, if you're interested in taking your business to the next level, you need to connect with Stephen. He's awesome. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The guy is very transparent. He posts his results right on Instagram for everyone to see. I don't really know anybody that does that. You can connect with him on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. You can find him at Stephen Comer, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Comer, K-O-M-M-E-R, And you can also check out his website, ascensiondigital.org. Steve's an awesome guy. You owe it to yourself to meet with this dude and talk to him. He's very inspirational. And for being such a young guy, he knows a shitload about business and how to get eyeballs on your business. So you can hook up with him through all of the social media channels and check out his website. Again, that's ascensiondigital.org. 
And uh, I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>